Welcome to Teaching No Greater Call on the Mormon Channel, brought to you by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm your host, Brother Russell T. Osgothorpe, Sunday School General President, and I'm with Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. This is the second part of an episode on gospel learning and teaching. Elder Bednar, it is great to be with you today talking about learning and teaching in the church and in the home. Um, I remember a time when this was just before an April conference. It was actually before the April conference when I was sustained as Sunday School General President. Mm -hmm. And we had, and I was at uh, an Area 70 at the time, and so I was in the training that occurs just before General Conference. And you were doing a training in that session, and I think it was almost just as an aside. It wasn't the central message that you had, but you said, let's remember, brethren, that teaching in the church is about teaching pure key doctrine, inviting people to action, and talking about promised blessings. So those three elements. And we've, when I heard that that day, I thought, as Sunday School General President, that was actually very helpful to me because I thought, I need to act on that in a sense. I need to help people in the church see that it's not only about dispensing information about doctrine, but we also need to invite people to action mm -hmm. and we need to talk about the promised blessings that come when we live a doctrine. So we've talked already in part one about the importance of inviting people, but I wonder if we could maybe talk some more about how does a teacher invite so that learners will really respond and act? How do we help people act? I'll, I'll give two illustrations, yeah. but I hope the illustrations won't be heard very well because they're examples of a higher principle. Mm -hmm. So for example, the, simply, the simple process of asking a question invites people to act. Mm -hmm. They do not have to respond. There are some people who are so terrified to speak, to raise their hand, that they would never comment. But if they will hear and respond to the question mentally and spiritually, they are acting, mm -hmm. though they don't overtly raise a hand. So simply posing a question is an example of inviting learners to act. Okay. That's a simple one. Second one. Yeah. For example, every class session is not self-contained. So I will frequently, a person will pose a question, and I know the answer for me. Mm -hmm. In the church, I think we far too often try to project our own answers for me onto everybody else. The issue is helping people get their own answer. So given a particular challenge or a particular issue, I'll just invite them to get a copy of the Book of Mormon, inexpensive missionary copy. Begin reading it from page one to the last page. You cannot cheat and do a computer keyword search. And if they're concerned about how do I forgive somebody who has wronged me in a mm -hmm. horrific way, I'll just invite them. Now, you read the Book of Mormon and you look for people, circumstances, cases where people were terribly wronged and they were willing to forgive. Find them. Study them. And when you get all done, just on a little piece of paper, two or three things that you learned from what you studied about those episodes. Now, that's reading the whole Book of Mormon. That's not going to happen from week one to week two. Right. But there may be a chapter or there may be an episode. And a part of where you pick up the next week is what did you learn as a result of doing that? Now, again, you know, we have our curriculum and we have so much stuff that we're supposed to cover. But a few minutes showing a continuity from what we learned last week to what we're doing this week is time very well spent. And very seldom do we do any follow-up, any review, any connection between lessons that we teach in the church like this. Which is a part of the reason why people don't believe us when we say, well, you need to read the stuff right. in preparation for the class. Sometimes it, they do, and it's like, okay, so why did I do that? Right. It'll never come up. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a training session that you did with uh, seminary and institute teachers, you invited those present, and I was one of those present, I remember I was sitting right in front of the <laughs> podium there. Um, you invited us to take a Book of Mormon like that and find the word strength or strengthen. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I have actually been doing that. 
We just finished Helaman today, so now we're in the third Nephi. We're getting toward the end of the Book of Mormon. We've been looking, and you said the same thing. You said, don't just do a computer search, because in a sense, and I wondered, why did he say that? But I think what you're saying is, don't uh, just look at single verses out of context, but look at the whole thing in context. And it requires you to act and to work. It to does. find them in the context. And you're, you're reading along, and here's the story, and you go, well, here's, here's Alma and his people being persecuted by Amulon. Yeah. Okay, in this whole episode, okay, I see how this strengthening thing fits in here. Right. You don't get that with a keyword search. You don't. So there's a, a work that is required to find them and extract them out of the, the context of the entire story. So just to show you how helpful this has been to us, to my wife and me, this morning we were reading uh, about the Nephites and Lamanites. At this point, of course, the Lamanites are better than the Nephites in, in that part of Helaman. And he talks, he's, uh, Samuel's talking to the, the um, Nephites and saying, you know, you've got to repent and be better or you're going to be destroyed. But then the verse says, but they were left unto their own strength and their own wisdom. You say, hey, this is a very, very important message in the Book of Mormon. If we rely on our own strength, our own wisdom, we're in trouble. And only and, and those other uh, strengthened words, most often, maybe 90% of the words in the Book of Mormon about strength and strengthen have to do with the Lord strengthening us. Hmm. And in fact, what this has done for us, it's helped me feel the Lord's strength, actually. When we're reading about how the Lord strengthened Captain Moroni or strengthened Nephi and Lehi, the descendants of Nephi and Lehi in, in Helaman, when it talks about how he strengthened them to do the hard work they had to do, I think I'm feeling this strength myself. So, in one sense, I, I took your invitation, my wife and I took it, and uh, it's borne fruit. It's, it's, it's been good. See, the Holy Ghost has taught you and your wife things for your relationship, for your family, for you right. as individuals, that no teacher standing in the front of a classroom could ever convey. I think the best answer to your question about what can you do to invite people to act mm -hmm. is that one who has been called as a teacher should seek for, appropriately, the this, this spiritual gift of discernment. And as that teacher is prayerful, then according to the needs of a particular class or of specific individuals, you will know in the moment what that invitation to act will be. So I don't want people to think, okay, you invite them to read or you invite them right. to ask questions. There's not a checklist. Right. That's why I said I don't want those two illustrations to obscure the overarching principle. Right. There are inspired invitations that you can't always pre-plan that will occur as you're inspired by the Holy Ghost. That's the key, is the receptivity to those impressions that will come from the Holy Ghost. And maybe one thing you're saying, too, is we shouldn't be too timid as teachers to extend an invitation. We should be willing to listen to what invitation the Lord would have us extend. Is that? What, the, exactly right, but there's a caution. Yeah. My observation is that in the culture of the church, mm -hmm. we frequently play the game called Guess What's in My Head. Right. And so a teacher will ask rote questions. So if it's a reading of the elements of the baptismal covenant, then the question often is, well, what are the three elements of the baptismal covenant? And a teacher will often call on someone and direct them to give the answer. Now, I would suggest that in that moment, the teacher is transforming that learner from an agent to an object who's now being acted upon. And we've all seen people do this in the most appropriate, with the greatest motive and intention, to try to assist people in learning. Right. But it puts people on the spot, and they feel awkward, and yeah, I know that until I got called on, and then they feel kind of <laughs> foolish. Right. Right. You have to honor people's agency. 
And it makes a world of difference when that person volunteers to answer the question instead of being directed to answer it by the teacher. So as long as that is preserved and honored and that you're constantly inviting people to act as agents, not be acted upon as objects, that's a part of what invites the Holy Ghost in a powerful way. Maybe on the one hand, we're inviting. When we, act, when we ask them to exercise their agency, we are, as teachers, inviting them mm -hmm. to act. This other kind is maybe imposing on them some answer that is in our head that we want them to and you know they want sure. them to say, but that's not that's not really an invitation in the sense that we're talking about it, right? This this invitation, the real invitation to act, always has this agency thing at its base, right? Can I give an extended example of this? Yeah. yeah. Now I want you to think about preparing a lesson and what you hope would be achieved in a, in a particular class and so forth. I was in another part of the world. And we had a very large congregation, probably about 1,500 people, and I was inviting people to ask questions. Mm -hmm. A sister posed the question, what can I do to help a wayward child? And I said, let me suggest three principles. And I said, this will not be a very satisfying answer. I'm not going to give you a list, go do this, but here are three principles you need to consider. You will need to be persistent with this wayward child. You will need to be patient with this wayward child. And you need to let the child act as an agent, and don't you constantly be acting upon the child. Now, I don't want that misunderstood. I don't believe the notion where you just, well, that they have their agency, they can do what they want. Right. That's a misunderstanding right. of agency. Right. But those were the three principles. We proceeded through the question and answer session. About 30 minutes later, a little 14-year-old boy raised his hand, and I called on him. He was in the very back of this very large chapel that we were in. And when I called on him, he absolutely freaked out. You know, he had his hand up, and I don't think he thought there was any chance in the world I would call on he him. He didn't think you'd do it. <laughs> and when I called yeah. on him, he just clutched. Mm -hmm. So the first thing his father did was start to ask his question for him. I said, Dad, hold on just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, please. Yeah. Just let, give the boy a little bit of time. He'll be fine. I was praying so hard that this little boy would be okay. Mm -hmm. So finally, he comes up with his question. He finally got to the point where he could articulate it. And I asked him, I said, do you have your copy of the Book of Mormon with you? And he said, I do. And I said, are you willing to read a verse for us? And this angelic little voice just goes, yes. And so he read this scripture. And I asked him, I said, now, what in that verse stands out to you and that helps you with the question that you asked? Now, I think a lot of people go, you can't do that with a 14-year-old boy. You have to do that with a 14-year-old boy. Exactly. 14-year-olds will never survive in the world in which we're going to live and in which we live now unless they get this for themselves. He gave the most incredible answer to his own question after he had had just a little bit of direction to a scripture that helped. And when we got all done with that episode, I turned to the sister and I said, patience, persistence, and quit acting upon the child and making him or her an object. And everybody in that congregation just kind of went, Elder Bednar, how did you set that up? How did you get this little boy to be the perfect demonstration of the principles you had articulated to this sister? <laughs> and the answer is, that's what the Holy Ghost does when we don't get in the way. Because in a sense, you were giving this invitation to him that you were trying to help them learn how to give in a way. And see, the invitation there was different. It wasn't just have him read. Mm -hmm. The invitation, I think, was much deeper than that. You know, in front of all these folks, given the fact that you've, you know, you're kind of really scared, can you step up here? And he got spiritual help to do that. So it wasn't just that he would read the scripture or speak. It, right. He was having quite a remarkable experience. Sometimes, I, I was with a, 
stake leadership meeting one time, uh, and we had a young man who was the executive secretary. And I said, giving invitations is not a really hard thing to do. I said, I'd like to give you one right now. I said, is there anything that you would like to do better in your life right now that you'd like to improve in? He said, well, are you talking like work things or gospel? I said, I don't care. I said, it's up to you. What comes to your mind when I say, is there something you'd like to improve in? And he said, I, I work at the hospital and I need to learn the names of the people I work with. I said, that's a good goal. That's a very good goal. I said, how, how do you think you might be able to do that? He said, well, I've got to sit down and list them out. I've got to get maybe their pictures or something. There aren't too many of them. I, I said, when do you think you could have that done? And he said, probably about two weeks. I said, is there any way that I could help you? And he, Would it help if you texted me? You could give me a text. This fellow was maybe 19 years old, 20 years old. And he said, that would help me if I had to text you back. <laughs> and I said, okay, so here's my phone number, so text me. He texted me back uh, a week later and said, I've done this, and it's been so helpful to me, and my work life is better. <laughs> this is a simple example, but invitations are really quite natural and simple. It's us helping each other through life. If we try to formalize them too much, then we'll be in trouble. If we Let me give right. one more quick one. Because... I don't want to make it seem that this always works really well. Right, right. I was in a large priesthood leadership conference, and we opened it up for questions, and a, a new convert who had come from a denomination where they had a very strict dietary code, mm -hmm. things you could and could not eat. So his question was, Elder Bednar, can I eat pork? And I said, uh, let me recommend that you read the 89th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. That contains what's called the Word of Wisdom, and you'll find your answer in there. And he said, that's not a very good answer. I just <laughs> want to know if I can eat pork. <laughs> and I said, uh, you have a copy of the Doctrine and Covenants? And he said, yes. And I said, section 89 is where you'll find the answer. And he almost started to get angry. Yeah. And uh, you know, he just kept saying, look. This isn't a hard question. I just want a yes or no. Can I eat pork? And after about three or four minutes, people were starting to get pretty nervous in the congregation. And I just said, look, let's just call this a truce. You're going to keep asking for a yes or no answer, and I'm not going to give you one. And the only way this is going to work out is you're just going to have to go read section 89, and that's where you're going to find the answer. Make your decision. And he was not happy. Uh, he was really not happy. And I was concerned that maybe he was offended or he thought I was being too hard on him or something. The next day, when we came for the general session, one of the folks who was there helping with the, the sound system came up and he said, that gentleman from the priesthood meeting came up to me this morning and he said, I don't know that I'll get to see Elder Bednar. But he said, you tell him, I found my answer. Hmm. Now, few things tickle me more. Yeah. He didn't say, I got an answer. He said, I found my answer. This is very much like when you talk about the prophet Joseph and talking about how he, I learned from myself. Now, see, yeah. take a look at that naturally occurring episode. Yeah. He comes from the sacred grove. His mom is at home. Mm -hmm. She observes and she discerns something has happened here. And she says, Joseph, are you okay in essence? And he says, Mother, I am well enough off. All is well. I have learned for myself. I think Joseph's mother had a crucial role in helping him continue to learn about what had just happened through the question that she posed. Joseph, are you okay? And his response, I think, is one of the most magnificent phrases in Scripture, I have learned for myself. Now, he didn't learn alone. Yeah. Had the, he had help, yeah. but he had learned for himself. And she was observing and listening. Exactly. And sensing that maybe something had happened that she needed to draw out of him mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Which is like the great teacher, drawing things out that need to be drawn out. I think perhaps one of the greatest examples of this is the role of the Holy Ghost 
teaching Nephi in 1st Nephi 11 through 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. And I have gone through that I don't know how many times looking for the questions that the Holy Ghost asks and also noting how the Holy Ghost invites Nephi to act. So just noting the number of times that the Holy Ghost says, Nephi, look, doesn't tell him what to see. Mm -hmm. He just says, look. And then the question is, what beholdest thou? And now Nephi acts and responds. Then the Holy Ghost can build on where Nephi is at. The pattern embedded in that scriptural episode, there's a real reason why that's at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, for us to pay attention and learn from that pattern. This is the line upon line kind of thing. Yeah. This may be an unfair question. I don't know. You can tell me if it is, but uh, you are obviously an avid learner of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're a de dedicated, diligent learner, as we all want to be. Could you talk a little bit about your pathway to that? Have you always been this intent on learning the gospel? Did it happen early in your life? What has been the pathway in your own life that's led to your desire to really understand the gospel? Well, I don't want to take too long, but there are a couple of benchmark, hallmark experiences in my life. Uh, one is my patriarchal blessing. Mm -hmm. And I won't repeat aspects of the blessing, but I am admonished there to study the scriptures at every available opportunity. And uh, I've tried to be true to that. And when I was a brand new missionary, this is long ago, but in those days, there was no missionary training center. There was a mission home in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And you would come to that mission home for a week and then go to a language training mission someplace in the world. And we had the experience of being taught by Harold B. Lee, who was a counselor in the First Presidency. It was in the solemn assembly room at the top of the Salt Lake Temple. And I think there may have been 250 or 300 missionaries. And President Lee came in in a white suit. He was a, a majestic, uh, imposing presence mm -hmm. right. with his silver hair and stuff. Right. And he just threw it open and said, ask any questions that you want. And to this day, I can see him standing there at that pulpit with his white scriptures. And every question that was asked, some a lot better than others, he answered from the scriptures or he said, I don't know. It hasn't been revealed. And as a 19-year-old, I sat there and I said, that's how you're supposed to do this. And I said, I'll never be able to do it the way he does, but that's the pattern of how you do this. And the other thing is... So that was the model of, in a sense, that led you to uh -huh. invite people to ask inspired questions. Sure. Is that okay? And you see that with so many of those brethren. Right. But the thing that fuels it more than anything else. I think a lot of people would say, well, you'd expect that for someone who's a member of the 12 or, mm -hmm. you know, but it's available to every member of the church. The Holy Ghost is the teacher and he fuels that curiosity and that spirit of inquiry. And that's available to each and every member of the church who has been baptized by proper authority, been commissioned by the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Ghost. That's where that comes from. And it's incremental. It's not all at once. I point to those episodes because those stand out to me, but the greater impact has just been consistent study of the scriptures, the teachings of the brethren, and seeing how all of those little pieces fit together. And none of us is smart enough to put them all together, but the Holy Ghost can help us see that. That, that to me is... Fun isn't the right word. That is just enjoyable. Yeah. I, let me just explain something that kind of nags at me at times. I think the Sunday school has a responsibility to help learning and teaching in the church. And really that means to help people experience the Holy Ghost more mm -hmm. often in their own life about how to live the principles of the gospel themselves. And so I keep thinking if we could get, if we could help people, more people in the church, more members, read the scriptures every day, if that were happening more often, I wouldn't have to worry too much about improving learning and teaching. I mean, if that were happening, if every member were an individually 
active, persistent, diligent learner, then teaching would be quite easy. So the real challenge is, how do we help motivate people to do that? And this could be, how do we motivate our children in our own home? How do we motivate those in classes in the church? How do we motivate ourselves? Uh, because if, if I go out to the church and I say, uh, how often should you read the Book of Mormon? Everyone's going to say, we should read it every day. If I say, how many of you are reading it every day? Different answer. Different answer. And so I say, oh, if we could just help more read it every day, then so many of our challenges, I think, would be solved. So how do we, this motivation thing, how do we, and maybe it's through this invitation thing, but. That's a part of it. Yeah. I think, too, in different places at various times, we can talk very honestly about not techniques, but just about the importance of studying the scriptures. Do you remember you said earlier that you showed a clip and people were kind of acting like they knew what it was until you asked them, what did you get out of that? Right. And then you were inspired to say, we want to see it again. Everybody in the church knows that the scriptures are vital. But the truth of the matter is, for some people, it's hard to study them. Right. They haven't had that experience. They don't know. We don't need to teach them how to do it. They can figure that out. But there's just barriers. Some people don't read very well. Right. And so that becomes a challenge. And they go, oh, I'm not reading them. Could I listen to them on audio? There's just all these issues. When I'm with missionaries, I'll ask them, have you ever had an investigator? You gave them a copy of the Book of Mormon, invited them to read. You came back the next time, and they hadn't read anything. Oh, yeah. And they're just devastated. Right. I said, do you understand why they didn't read it? Well, no, it never occurs to them to ask. <laughs> but if you ask, so can you help me understand what it was like for you reading the Book of Mormon for the first time? If an investigator says, I don't get all this, and it came to pass, all this Bible-sounding kind of language, that doesn't make sense to me. That's hard to follow. What a glorious answer, because now you know more about where they are and how you could help them. So I think we have in the church a bit of a challenge with people not being willing to say, I need some help. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's what we tell them, but could I get just a little bit of help in learning how to do this. And finding out what kind of help they need. You know. As a mission president, I had a missionary who had a reading disability. He called one day and he said, uh, President, has the pre Preach My Gospel been put on CD? And at that time it hadn't. Preach My Gospel was quite new. I said, it hasn't, but we'll find a way to help you. And my wife talked to his companion and said, during morning study, why don't you take a few minutes of morning study and record Preach My Gospel. So his companion recorded the entire book of mm -hmm. Preach My Gospel so that his companion could listen to it and read along with it and improve his reading at that time, at the same time. I saw that missionary with the reading problem um, eight months, nine months later. He was reading out of Ecclesiastes, and when he st stood up and started reading, I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I hope he can read this, you know, because he did have a serious reading problem. He read through it quite flawlessly. I looked to, to the sister next to me and I said, a year ago, he could not have read that at all. And she said, really? I didn't realize he had a reading problem. And I said, he used to have a reading problem. Yeah. Yeah. But with this kind of help, getting him the right kind of help, uh, he succeeded. See, one other quick illustration. Yesterday I received an email. Yeah. It was a person who said, uh, let me describe how the Mormon channel helps me. Mm -hmm. It takes me about 45 minutes to drive to my work. I, I can set up a playlist and I can listen to talks or general conference or Ensign articles, whatever. I'm in the scriptures. And this individual said, I read the scriptures because I know I'm supposed to, but I don't focus as well doing that as when I'm listening. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. that's not an excuse not to read them. Right. He does both. But he was just so honest about, look, I struggle sometimes to do this. I do it because I know I'm supposed to, but I don't get out of it what I probably need to. But yet he's seen a combination of resources 
where he can both listen and read that works for him. So if people would just be forthright in expressing in their own families, with their eternal companions, with their children, you know, help me understand how you do this, because you seem to get something yeah. out of this that I'm not getting. So maybe, There's help. Yeah, maybe even as ourselves, if, if we ourselves are having difficulty reading the scriptures every day, we need to ask ourselves, why am I not doing it? What kind of help do I need? As a and preparation then, to ask Heavenly Father uh -huh. for the help. Right. See, we, right. we tend to want to say, well, the church needs to do something. No. If the desire of your heart is to feast upon the words of Christ, right. then let Him help you by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's wonderful. Thank you, Elder Bednar, for your wisdom, your help, and your instruction, and your spirit. Uh, this has been, for me personally, a very valuable session. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you for listening to Teaching No Greater Call on the Mormon Channel, brought to you by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.